Hello, 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 everybody, and uh, welcome to episode number 20. Wow, 2-0. I didn't even realize this was uh, episode 20 of the uh, Creative Outlet Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Brandon Pudwell, and uh, you know, it's... Uh, let's see, what even is today? It is June 6th, 6 6 of 2022. And you know, as always, it's... Uh, it's been a while, as seems to be the usual uh, pattern here uh, for the show. That's just how these, I have to figure out, working on stuff between semesters seems to be. Uh, and so we're here. We're here. Uh, another semester has closed for me uh, as far as college-related schooling. And so now that means da 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 I'm a graduate again. <laughs> Uh, of course, three years ago at around this time, I was a high school graduate, and now I'm a college graduate. So that, I think, is pretty darn neat, if and I do say so myself. Um, and, you know, in the moment, I think it, it doesn't really feel too different right now being uh, a college graduate, but it, I, I am glad to be done. I, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I'm, I'm glad... Uh, that I've finished up these uh, studies, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to belabor these points too long right now, uh, because I really want to end this episode with more of my full college reflections. But I mean, I kind of had to bring it up because it's like sort of kind of, you know, the the biggest change in my life right now that I've got a degree, and that really just means that right now I am in job searching mode which means i don't know well aside from hitting my computer which maybe i can edit out we'll see you never want to promise anything to be edited in uh post because that's a lot easier said than done um but anyway uh yeah i'm in job searching mode right now which leaves question marks as far as well how frequently am i going to be able to uh to, to do this show. I mean, you know, I, I want to try, of course. I would rather have this show than not have the show, but, um, you know, I, I kind of need to have a job that makes me money, a career -y job, you might say, uh, before I can go ahead and just let me spend personal time on uh, making a uh, podcast when I don't have a job that's bringing me a, a, a full income. <laughs> Uh, but the good news with that is it does mean that once I do have a job, uh, I should be able to make hopefully a consistent schedule for this show. And maybe that hopefully also means I can make some of the changes that I've been uh, thinking about for a while now. Um, once I have a place that has a real studio for sure, like, you know, maybe I can get some sound treatment. Obviously, uh, if you're watching this on the the video podcast, you're probably thinking, "Man, where's all that video? I guess, is this just a tradition for these reflecting on the semester episodes that there's no video?" And no, it's not really that. It's just I, I would reference the fall uh, reflections episode for more detail, but I don't really have a space that really fits my uh, aesthetic for the show. You might say so. I'm just kind of I, I would rather have. A, a better just like nice audio experience for everyone than have forcing people to you know look at me sitting in front of a closet right now with a bunch of clothes which at least makes decent ish sound treatment it's not as good as if i put up uh actual foam on the walls and hopefully that's something uh kind of getting circling back around to what i could have when i have a, a studio that's mostly well that's that's mine uh that maybe that means I can have some sound treatment, you know, some, some foam on the wall. That'd be pretty neat. Uh, but, you know, because otherwise I really don't <laughs> I haven't had any uh, audio treatment for these uh, these episodes. Um, and then as far as the video the video goes, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get that, uh, that capture card coming at some point here because that would make putting together the video a lot easier if I can show a long bit of gameplay. Uh, related to topics I talk about, like, uh, I mean, if I talked about Kirby, for example, I don't have Kirby right now, uh, 
because I, yeah, yeah the, the demo didn't persuade me to pick it up, even though people claim that it's apparently a revolutionary amazing game, but that's neither here nor there right now, but I could just plop one piece of gameplay over and be done with it, more or less. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, I don't really want, I feel like I might be sort of retreading some of what I said in uh, the last couple of episodes, because I just, I just love doing reflection uh, podcasts, I guess. Um, but, you know, may maybe that, maybe I'll be able to get a new mic, we'll have to, we'll just, we'll have to, I have to feel things out and see how see how things go I, on a microphone sort of thing. I wouldn't expect that until maybe next year, but we'll 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 see what happens. Um, anyway, so this this episode uh, is uh, as the title states, reflections on the spring two thousand and twenty two uh, semester, uh, sort of mimicking what I had for the fall episode, right? And like in that episode, I want to run down the classes that I took uh, this spring semester, and I want to describe my time with them. But before uh, before I start talking about the classes I took, I want to make a special section here dedicated to um, my time with the student organization I was a part of, because obviously now being, being a graduate, not being at that college anymore, I'm not part of it anymore. Shocker. <laughs> Uh, I, want, I want to do just a sort of a sort of a send off um, with my time there, uh, but but I'm, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that, and then I kind of want to talk about my classes. But I think if I recall the in that episode, episode number eighteen, I sort of did it in a ranked order as far as which ones I thought were the best and which ones I thought weren't so great. Um, I didn't find the classes this semester to be so much rankable. I thought they were all pretty good. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to go up about this in just any odd any odd order here. Uh, as far as when I put together some notes here, I was like, eh, I'm just going to put them in the order that I happen to remember them then. But I want to start with this uh, send-off, though. Um, and one thing I've never really done in this show, and I'm not going to do it here, uh, is I don't... I... I don't really want to reveal where I went to school. And now, obviously, it's not so much a big deal right now because I'm not there anymore. But I just, I don't, I don't, I don't like revealing my location. I mean, I'm sure if people tried hard enough, if they're real crafty, real techy, they could probably uh, figure it out. But it's, it's, it kind of, kind of weirds me out. I don't, I don't need people trying to, trying to find me, even if I have... Uh, not much of an audience right now, right? Uh, and, you know, it's not like I'm in a, a major city like how Pat and Ian of the Completely Unnecessary podcast, they're, they're in San Diego. I mean, you can be just about anywhere in San Diego, California, because it's, it's, it's a pretty sizable city. Um, but the folks from, you know, by my college, they're going to know where I was because... We were all there um and they're gonna know like you know they're gonna know who they are and where i was and all that stuff so uh i, I mean i guess the long story short sort of with the opening reflection is it's kind of surreal that things are over especially because of how things um shook out as far as my time there like each year with this organization is vastly different um and if i haven't uh, made it clear i was already but i think i've talked about this before on this show, just kind of appealing to the general audience, uh, I was part of uh, a speech and debate organization. And each year that I was in it was characterized with a different level of activity. Uh, my first year, I'd say I was like averagely active, averagely engaged. You know, I went to meetings. Uh, there were some that I missed because I had other things going on at the time. Uh, and I participated. I love judging. Uh, but I did. I definitely did participate in a handful of debates uh, here and there. Uh, the second year, my uh, sophomore year of college, I famously described many times as being in the void, uh, which is to say that I couldn't really be there because I wasn't on campus. I don't know how many other people were on campus or were not on campus at all. And, you know, it, it was already a struggle sort of mentally to be like, I need to go to this synchronous online class and pay attention for however long over over Zoom, however long the, the classes might be. Um, so, like, I can't even imagine trying to do a two-hour sort of activity on online, right? 
for for an organization so like i you know it wasn't as if i wasn't thinking about this sort of thing in the background but i just i could not bring myself and it's just even with all the things that i was doing to think about i'm going to carve out another couple of hours in my schedule to do uh this activity that isn't even coming in what i would consider to be really be a familiar a fam familiar form of it so but then this past year, this third year, my final year of college, uh, I would say I did the most activity, the most engagement that I ever did with these folks. And, um, and it was mostly because, yeah, it was my, my last year. I wanted to make a point of this is my last year. I need to make sure that I am giving back to this group in some way, because what's the point of being in a group if you don't contribute to it at all, right? Um, and, and, and I had some marks I wanted to make. I, I think I talked about this a little bit in the last, um, semester reflection podcast about some of the things I did, uh, but I don't think it hurts to, hurts to kind of go over them, uh, again here. And, you know, I'm, I'm just proud of the little bits that I was able to accomplish in, uh, the last year. Of course, I, I participated in debates and that in and of itself was, uh, engaging and you know there, there were some really special <laughs> special topics that we uh debated and i got to watch and and then discuss on uh the podcast that i made with folks there so uh, i talked many times on on the show that i made uh with my speech and debate folks about the very first uh debate that i participated in and the very first debate uh that i can recall um being done for the organization how memorable <laughs> it was for me uh, you know, we debated whether it was acceptable to consume art made by quote-unquote gravely unethical actors. Um, and, you know, I told that story many times on their show, so I don't really want to reiterate it again here for the folks who have heard it before. But, you know, not only was that just a memorable uh, debate for me just because, hey, I was on the winning team, uh, and it's on a topic that I wouldn't say. I'm like, this is like, oh, something that I care about a ton, but something that I think is a, it's, it's just a very philosophically interesting question um but you know i got to i got to use my my beloved uh medium of uh games as a strong example in that debate and, and again i'm sure i've discussed it many times um on there but you know i talked about that uh i i i just i'm struggling to come, come to figure out how to put it into words here but i'll just i will treasure the fact that I was able to use, of all things, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles as an example in a debate, because that just seems completely out of, completely out of left field for people when they're thinking about gravely unethical actors, Sonic 3 and Knuckles, where, where does this all come together? So, uh, obviously I, exp I explained it on there, you know, Michael Jackson, he allegedly did the music on, or did some of the music for the game. Then he had all of his uh, famous legal troubles, ethical troubles, I think would be a little bit more of a, uh, a better way of describing it, but I digress. That's not super important right now. Uh, probably one of the best debate topics, though, that I got to discuss on the podcast I made with them uh, wasn't, it was an episode where the guest and I, uh, because, you know, for the show that I did for them, it was more or less an interview between myself and another member of the organization, we talked about uh, legalizing duels, as in, you know, stand behind each other, take 10 paces, turn around and shoot each <laughs> shoot at each other. Uh, and, and that's an episode that I will also always cherish. I, you know, I don't, I don't ever really go back and listen to the pieces um, that I've made because I think that would be, I think that would be a little egotistical to do and maybe a little strange. I don't know if, people would agree with that assessment i just something something feels off about me going i just made this recording and i am going to listen back to it on the service that i published it on and hear the sound of my own voice like that, that just seems a little self-centered to me uh but you know if there's ever an episode i would make an exception for it was that particular episode because honestly it's it's probably one of the best conversations that i've ever recorded uh between two people and to this day i think about the the laughs that i was able to have uh with that guest and you know just the laughs i've had with others and the deep 
thought-provoking conversations about issues that I had as a result of of um, making that episode and other ones. And, and it's especially interesting, too, because I think... I think the episodes, I wouldn't say they necessarily all just improved on each other as time went on, but there are definitely a lot. Uh, the ones that I made in the second semester are ones that I am especially proud of um, making. And you know, they, they didn't get uh, quite as many listens as the rest. So I hope I hope that, you know, people go back and and uh, and and. and listen to those if they haven't yet because there there's some fantastic uh conversations there and you know it, it was also especially interesting too because obviously just being in uh an organization focused on an activity like uh speech and debate means that you're not necessarily all connected on the same sorts of stuff just in general like you definitely have that one deep connection of either loving prepared speech loving debating or just like public speaking in general but that doesn't mean you have a deep love of everything together you know so like that that conversation where we legalize duels the the guest and i i wouldn't say we necessarily connect on a lot of stuff he's a lot more of a sporty person i'm a lot more of a nerdy person um but yeah yeah we just had a, a a great conversation, which I mean, that's why I love the the medium of the the conversational podcast, like I do here, um, because it's not just that I can get my thoughts out in a in a coherent way, but also I can help someone else get their thoughts out in a, a coherent way of of some type that hopefully is also entertaining for for people to listen to. So, like I said, I think it's unfortunate that like as the show went on, the the listens seem to get smaller and smaller especially that one because i consider it to be one of the best (laughs) episodes one of the one of the most hilarious uh topics talking about how sort of like you know i mean how how could we realistically ethically work a way of having a legal duel it it was just it was hilarious um in my opinion um but you know maybe that just means it'll make a it'll make a comeback in the future um the, the maybe the more i tout it the more people will be like, yeah, I should go back and listen to that episode. But that that requires certain assumptions that, you know, I'm continuing to interact, which, yeah, it, well, we'll just have to see what happens. Um, but of course, I'd also be remiss in not talking about the uh, interactions that I had with speech folks, especially because I'm someone who came from a forensics background originally. You know, I was a four-year forensicator in, in high school, but, you know, there, there just weren't enough uh, things that would make it work out such that I could continue doing that, like sort of prepared speech work in, in college, especially in this last year. So I just, I found it to be a real treat to get to, to connect with some of those people doing speech because it it reminded me how much I enjoy prepared speech, like seeing the, the speech, the way that speech people work versus the way that like debate people work on stuff. I mean, it's not like they're too terribly different because at the end of the day, they're still like public speaking in the end. And I didn't get to do a ton of that side. I mostly recorded like trainings and events with the people on the speech side. So I wouldn't say I necessarily like had the full experience and I had some of the speech people on the podcast, which again, it's not the full experience, but the little that I did get to reconnect with um, forensics, it, like, it was just fantastic. Cause, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think of this as like a small example here, but it, it had been like three years since I had seen someone like just take out take out the, ador- the adorable tiny little prose binder and, and getting to use it as, as a prop and like seeing people perform with all the all the binder tech and just like delivering a speech and like all, all the all the little um quirks that are in a forensic performance and again i just i hadn't seen in about three years and it just it, it got it got some nostalgia going to me i was like man i really do miss this so I, I i really appreciated that opportunity in the last year to even if i was just sort of in the background holding a holding a camcorder hooking people up to 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 microphones is is just is really appreciated. And I guess since I brought it up, I should probably talk about um, some of the some of the media I did too. I already talked about the uh, some of the podcast stuff I did there, um, and I should say there there was 
uh, for the folks who are there listening to this, there was an additional final podcast that I did as I bumped the mic and potentially make more noise. Uh, that was the final piece I did. In fact, I had a whole grand plan of like three final episodes I wanted to do for that podcast that ended up not working out, which was a real shame to me. I wanted to do a, like a debate team episode, by which I mean like the way that um, British parliamentary debate works for the folks who are not all like in that debate realm is you have, you have a team of two, right? Um, like four teams of two all going up against each other. They zigzag across. Um, half of the side of the room is in favor of a particular motion and the other half isn't, right? And I wanted to have a team episode as far as like two people come together and we would hash out like, okay, so sort of doing what I did with other episodes where I'd interview and we get to know them as people, uh, maybe celebrate some successes that we'd had if we had any competitions over that time and then talk about emotion. Except the, the, the difference would be how would, like, I, I'd, I'd want to go into more detail about this is how you tackle emotion as a team of people as opposed to just one person and I hashing it out. Uh, because, I mean, you know, effectively we could act as a team in that scenario, but it's totally different, um, like, talking through emotion with somebody that you actually compete with frequently, um, whether it's just in practices or in tournaments, of course. And that's what I want to do. Scheduling just didn't work out on that. And then the last two episodes I had in my grand plan, I wanted to celebrate our, our two final major tournaments, our final debate tournament, and then the final speech tournament. And, of course, the week that I am preparing to do the big, like, debate episode, I get sick. And, you know, you don't want to get other people sick. I, don't, I didn't even know what I had, but it's just like, I, I, don't, I don't need to spread anything to anyone, whether it's, like, terrible, horrible COVID or it's just a, a cold or whatever. I, just, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need that. No one else needs that. I can stay here. And so that plan fell through. And then... Uh, again scheduling kind of became a little bit of a challenge with the the final speech episode i'm not i'm not really upset about uh that at all it's just it's fine it happens um and so i was like well i also wanted to take this opportunity to um record in this other studio that was on campus i was just i never had the opportunity to record there before i wanted to try it out i finally had that opportunity um and then i uploaded because the way that the files were structured on there on the SD card for the device we were using. We were using the Rode, uh, well, I, I think the microphone's called the Procaster, but we are using, like, essentially the Rode, um, like their soundboard, their mixer, uh, sort of thing. Let me see what that's, uh, let's see what that's called, the Rode, uh, the, uh, the Rodecaster. I think the, the one I'm looking at here is the right one, uh, here. It doesn't matter. It's one of those Rode, uh, I think it's one of those Rodecaster Pro products of some kind. Uh, and so you just stick a micro SD card in there and it records to that. And the it was really weird with the file structure on there when I took the micro SD card out of the computer and like tried plugging it into the computer that we had there so I could upload it and, and eventually bring it back here and edit it. And like the dates were all wrong on it and I finally found what I thought was the right file for what these three people and I had just recorded. And then I went to go put it here in Audacity, which I'm recording on right now. And it was like only 12 minutes long, even though we were recorded for like a very long time. So I'm assuming what happened is the Procaster probably split the file up into a bunch of different, like the, the full thing into a bunch of different files. And we're also like, we're timed as far as how long you can stay in, um, one of the, the suites in the building we're in, and there's only one podcasting suite, of course. So it's like, even though I doubt anybody else is going to be using this, I, I don't need to have troubles with the people because they actually monitor the suites. So I wasn't even able to go back and like get the rest of the files. So unfortunately, that's probably going to end up being like the lost episode for the rest of time, unless somebody can figure out how to get the rest of the audio. But I was just... It was a bit of a, a mess, and I, I think that's a, I think that's a shame. But that's just kind of what it is. And it, you know, even in the end, we did a little sort of mini send off for me. So th that's also part of why I'm doing this now, is because I wanted to do a, a bigger send off here, like sort of uh, appreciating all the things um, that I did with folks there, and 
obviously that episode didn't end up being able to air, so we weren't able to have it there, and it's it's just a shame, but uh, it is it is what it is now. But back to the regularly scheduled rest of that um, conversation, I want to talk about the some of the videography I did. So, uh, you know, I, I re pretty much just recorded every sort of, like, training session bet that um, occurred between the two semesters on the debate side. To my knowledge, there weren't so many sessions for the speech side, although I did record at the very start of the semester um, a long, like a full day sort of training session between our college and another um, uh, university that we just collaborated on together. Um, and, you know, I even got to record a couple of extra videos over the semester as well. Like I got to, I, I was there to help record some, some, some guest lectures and like a tournament reflection sort of thing. Um, and I even had the benefit of making an appearance on my own film myself, uh, because at the very end of this past semester, we had like a banquet where we all got together and celebrated and there were some speeches and graduates got to say, say, say a few words about their, their times, which, which I appreciated. Um, but of course the video that's, that I, I made that will, that will always be my favorite as far as a video that I made for, um, this organization is the, the trailer that currently headlines the, uh, the, the, their website. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'd honestly call it one of the videos that I've made that I'm the most, I'm the most proud of, you know, I, I haven't, I've mostly made like short, um, narrative films. I haven't had the opportunity to make many sort of trailer pieces. And so just being able to do something that was very different. And again, I'm, I'm sure I talked about this a bit in the fall, uh, reflection episode, just because that, I, I also made it for a class that I, it was an aside, but that I had to make something like that for, um, and, you know, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's revolutionary or, or anything, but it's just, it's invigorating to know that something you made, in this case, something I made, it's going to have a life that goes past its initial use. And because and, usually the videos that I've made were just like, okay, it needs to get graded and then it's done. I don't ever have to think about it again. It's over. Um... And, you know, I can't, I can't pretend like, kind of like I talked about how I will not listen to the pieces that I've made after I've fully released them, because I think that would be a little self-centered here. I can't act like I've, I've, I've watched that video a bunch of times afterward because I'm proud of it. Um, but I do know for a fact, uh, that it has been viewed over 50 different times now. Like it might be in the sixties or, or seventies at this point, um, as far as the, the quantity of views that that video has gotten. So, you know, I, there are students who I guarantee were persuaded to join the organization, or at least like, you know, they got a, a pretty good handle of the sorts of things that we do, uh, as a result of seeing that video. And, you know, I, I am that that's something that I'm, I, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that I could like help people make that decision to join is something that makes me go, Oh, it, it gives me, it gives me the warm fuzzies. <laughs> so, you know, if, if by some miracle there is somebody listening to this who, uh, either joined that organization or, uh, you know, just were like, Oh, now, now I see what you do, um, better before I even like joining as a result of seeing that video, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Like, it's, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty neat. And, you know, honestly, I could probably spend hours if I wanted to recounting different uh, stories about my time um, over the last three years, Espe again, especially in the last year um, with speech and debate. Uh, but I also, I also want to move this podcast into some of the, the uh, school class based uh, topics and maybe, maybe some of the future uh here for me and what it holds. So I think I think I want to end uh, this discussion of my time in speech and debate, sort of reiterating something that I talked about in those uh, brief remarks I mentioned that I got to make at the banquet. So something that I I challenged my my peers to do was it was kind of an amalgamation of themes from a couple of different speeches. Of course, I I thanked everybody that was a theme in another speech that someone else had made earlier in the night and of course that's that's very important to thank and remember everybody but um the the main crux of my speech were based on one that had been given earlier in the night that was the the speech was mo mostly focused on the fact that you know students care 
the an organization won't exist if there aren't students who care and want things to like continue right uh but the other crux of my speech was derived from like a similar speech that i gave three years ago as i was becoming a high school graduate um and, and in that speech my main concern was like students need to take advantage of uh the opportunities that they that they have and i think i think what i said on that night when i originally delivered that uh this speech kind of bears repeating and it said i really hope that you know future students uh th it's that they care to create that was the line that i had sort of uh considered in my head as i was listening to these speeches and i was like i need to come up with something that i'm gonna say is i know i, I know i want to reiterate this theme because i think it's very important that students like give back and that they create but i think that idea of caring about it in the first place is really important too because i know that a lot of folks there um you know they they have talents and there's just there's just all kinds of work that could be made as a result of those talents and in, in my case it was that it was the videos and it's this audio work um that i uh, that i made over these semesters that was the final conclusion of my caring to create and then you know and some other students it's gonna come in the form of like planning finances if they're like business students or um maybe it'll be politicking to become the organization president and actually make craft uh policies and events that are um useful to the organization and i just i, I just hope that people don't i if people remember me that's great i don't really care if people remember me the human being specifically uh, i just care that they they remember to keep putting forth their talents and their abilities at the forefront because i mean you know that's really why they join they, they joined an organization like speech and debate is because they have a talent and an ability to debate or to write and deliver a prepared speech. Um, but I also know that they have talents beyond that, right? Uh, yeah, and I, and I saw that every week. I saw that when it, when people would come with their cameras and, and take pictures. I saw that when people would talk about the examples they have and the knowledge that they have um, that would advance their arguments. I saw that when people were like, I want to run for a particular position in... Um, the organization than they wanted or they didn't win it and that, that just was what it was um and I, I just hope people don't lose those those talents those wants um after their brief time in in college like i'm i'm gonna keep doing a, a podcast of some type here even though i'm out of college and i'm not ex explicitly studying this sort of stuff anymore just because it is a talent it's an ability i have a desire to to keep doing it and i i just i hope that's what people do so <laughs> uh now i guess with that uh attempt at sort of soaring rhetoric uh i suppose i should move on to uh talking about the the classes i took this final semester of college uh so i was in five classes uh, instead of the six i had last time although it was barely six considering one was a single credit class um and you know, I think I had an, an interesting variety. I think I described the way these classes would be as like, I, it's just the grab bag of, I need this many of like higher upper level classes of some kind. Um, so I was able to take a, a pretty decent variety of things that I was interested in. Um, I took a class that I'd been wanting to take to for, uh, that I'd been wanting to take like forever, <laughs> which was uh, video games and learning. And then that was a, it's technically under like curriculum and instruction. So it's like this meta education class about education. Um, I took a film editing class. Uh, let's see, I took a class that was quite literally on uh, the structure of English, as in this is how sentences are made. Um, I took a class on legal research and writing, which I think could have some interesting uh, implications for if I were to decide to go into uh, law school. And then lastly, I was also in a creative writing class this uh, semester as well. So now I suppose we should uh, go about talking about them then. And of course, I want to start with uh, video games and learning, because like I said, that was a class that I'd wanted to take for a long time. And so the way that class was set up was pretty interesting. Um, the lectures were 
online synchronous, but they were not traditional online synchronous. They were not, you need to get onto Zoom and I'll have a presentation. No, 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 no. Uh, the way the professor does the lectures for that class is that she hosts them on Twitch. So we, we would get to, to have a live stream and she would uh, sort of be playing a game that had to do with um, a topic we were talking about at the time. Like maybe we were talking about... Um, uh, particular principles that were in uh, this book that we uh, studied over the course of the semester, or at least it was from a, maybe it wasn't from a book. It, it might be a chapter in a book, but for sure it was from um, an, an, an important article to what we were uh, learning about. And uh, we, we would have this lecture, right? And we would get, we like, we would we'd see her play and then she would ask us, uh, questions about the sorts of things that were that were working here, or or maybe here's here's another good example. I'm I'm actually pulling up the the uh, different topics that we had. Like uh, uh, here's a good one. Here's expertise. Uh, that was actually a week where we had a guest lecture. Um, but you know, it, it isn't expertise in the sense that it's like you're an elite gamer and you know how to play this game brilliantly. But it's about how. Like, you know, games obviously reward that type of expertise. They reward your ability to play a game very well. And, like, we, 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 we would get questions about how do we apply that sort of thing in an educational setting? How do we apply that in a classroom? And I, find, I found that kind of stuff fascinating uh, because it wasn't explicitly gamification, which is actually something that the professor is kind of like, mm, I don't really like gamification. I have a soft spot for it because I did a project a few years ago on gamification, so I actually like really value it. Um, but I can I can under, I can understand and I can appreciate, especially from the things I I learned in that class, why maybe gamification isn't necessarily uh, the best um, sort of way to motivate people. But I think I think you know the the things that I learned in that class like. Are, are, we're kind of closer to what I was getting at, but you know that that's a that's a dispute for another time. Uh, that's not really that important right now. But uh, yeah, it, as far as assignments that we did in that class, it was a lot of writing, uh, like a shocking amount of writing. Well, not, not even shocking, I should say, because I I think the class was sort of listed as like this is a this meets a certain um, requirement that the university has that you have to take like an upper level um, writing class of some type. Uh, and so what we did is we had to, uh, pick a game of some kind. I was inspired by a review, uh, by, uh, Nitro Rad. He reviewed this game a couple of years ago, or maybe it was just last year. I don't remember. I could look it up right now how many years old the, uh, review is, but it's really not that important how old it is. Uh, he reviewed Hypnospace Outlaw, uh, which is... Uh, oh, three years ago. Wow, this game, that game is a lot older than I thought. Um, it's a, I played it on PC. I could have bought it on Switch, actually, even as a cartridge and everything. I, I probably still will because, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted another physical copy, dang it. Uh, and, but it's a game where you, like, sort of play a 1990s internet simulation in the sense, like, you know, when I, when you play the game, it's like you're you're taking on this role, sort of like as a moderator. You're a, a member of the Hypnospace Patrol Department, the HSPD, and you have to go through these particular cases that get sent to you, and uh, like police certain things that are happening on the internet in this like alternate history 1999, right? And so what I had to do for the class is first I had to well. I had to write three journal entries describing my time with the game and um, identifying these principles that I thought were important that I was going to use ultimately uh, in this final research paper I would write. So the, the final product that we had was like a, an eight to 10 page research paper talking about like you could, you could take it in two different directions. Uh, you could take it talking about these principles from this author, uh, James Paul G. Uh, he identified, I think, 13 different principles that games use that uh, could be applied in uh, education. And 
uh, I ended up talking about like the way that Hypnospace Outlaw uses um, just-in-time information, so like an information delivery system where um, the idea is that games deliver information to players either as soon as they need it, so in that sort of Goldilocksian, uh, it's just right sense like like i'm getting this information not too early not too late i'm just i'm finding out something right as i need to know about it or um you could have it on demand so i think of that as like how in games you can hit the hit the pause button and pull up a description of what all the buttons do on your controller that's information on demand i need to know what the, this particular button does i need to figure out how i do this action that i need to do so i'm going to pull up the like control map and I'll find out, right? Right now, I need it now. I'm demanding it. Just in time for comparison is just so, like, in the game, uh, in Hypnospace Outlaw, you have all these cases. And so, uh, for example, you would learn about, oh, I have this... Uh, I'm, I'm in the second case right here. I think this is an interesting example where I got to tie in a, another text as well that I think was related to... Um, uh, sort of just-in-time information delivery, there was a side quest in the second case of the game. Uh, in the second case, you opened up the Teentopia Zone. So um, in Hypnospace Outlaw, when you're going across the internet, you have all these different zones of, like, different pages that sort of go together with a different uh, topic. So, like, in Teentopia, all of the pages are either, like, blogs for teens or they're about products that teens might be interested in, like game consoles or just... Like, again, things that teens might would think would be cool, right? And in that case, you need to sort of police a kid who's a teen who's bullying another teen. Uh, but one thing you can find when you're searching through these pages is, like, in the background, there are these weird images that show up that are just, like, they don't they don't fit in the, the, the background of the page at all. And what it turns out is those are squishers. And Squishers is this whole parody of Pokemon to the point where they even come up, they, the, the, the developers even made a Squishers rap that's it's just a parody of the, the real world Poke rap from the 90s. And I just, I think that's hilarious. Uh, but you don't, and, and so it turns out there's this whole Squishers quest on Hypnospace where you, you, you need to find the 10 Squishers that are like hidden and lost in Teentopia. And you need to need to bring them back by clicking on them. But you don't learn about this quest until you click on the the first squisher. So it's it's delivering, like I said, that information just in time. It's not like you learn about the squisher's quest through an email, and it's like oh, I don't really want to do that because it's it's not really related to my case. Or like you could get completely distracted. You're learning about it like as soon as you're like, what the heck is up? Like with this weird image on the screen, I'm gonna I'm gonna click on it. It it shows up as a clickable object, and then you learn about the question. And you're like, oh, I should try to do this because I'm already in Teentopia anyway. I should like try to look around the pages and find out um, more more about this. So uh, I found that to be a, a particularly interesting. Uh, sort of like aspect of the game and so like i said it, there there were other principles i focused on in the paper i think the, I, I think I, we had to do two to three uh with the the depth that i wanted to provide each one i only didn't only ended up discussing two the other one i talked about is meaning which is really great for me because one dream i've always had and i tell you this is how you can tell that i am a real dork who loves english and uh like has, has kind of been in education for for a long time or at least i've just been in, in school for you know what 16 years now i guess um i had all i've always wanted ever since i learned like and like did my first ever literary analysis in an english class you know where you analyze a piece of writing i was like man i've always wanted to do this with a game and like talk about all the themes in it as a result of the gameplay or just the story itself or the things that it's trying to explore. And I finally got to do that by talking about meaning in Hypnospace Outlaw and it was so cool. So like there's all kinds of ethical questions that these cases really present the player to, 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 to take on, right? So for example, in the very first case of the game, uh, it's a case about copyright infringement. There are five kinds of like cyber crime so to speak on hypnospace they fit in this uh acronym chime uh it's copyright infringement harassing content 
um, illegal content. So that includes jump scares for some reason, because I mean, I don't, I don't want to know what kinds of things illegal content could mean. It could probably mean some really scary uh, stuff that they're like, we don't really want to go into this. So we're going to come up with something different. Uh, let's see, what's M? M, M, M is, uh, oh my goodness. Oh, malicious content. So that's like viruses. And then E is extra legal commerce. So uh, that's just a fancy way of saying that like, on, on Hypnospace, there they created currency that like people in the in-game world would use. So as a player, like you'll get this hypno coin is what it's called for like completing tasks. And but there are people in the world of the game, like actual users, if they were if they're real people, right? These characters, they want to use di a different currency because, as it turns out, you cannot turn hypno coin into real money right so you can't really have like an online business because you can't make money other than hypno coin which is only useful on hypno space so unless you really really want to spend all your time making hypno coin and not making real money to survive you can't it's it's kind of it's kind of screwy so this extra legal commerce is basically just saying it's not illegal like actual illegal money in the real world it's kind of outside in this like unregulated world, but the HSPD is just like we're gonna say it's illegal for here. I guess I don't I don't know. I had just I had to learn. I was like, what the heck does extra legal mean? Oh, it's it's unregulated. So like the comparison I made for people, if like so that they could easily under understand it, is it's kind of like uh it's kind of like Bitcoin. It's not an illegal currency. But there's just it's it's not been regulated. There's not an actual like understanding of like this is oh this is this is what it it is. It's not it's not a government currency. Anywho, but like in each case, I got to explore sort of different themes as a result of like, am I making a real moral decision here? Like the proper moral decision in this case, like in the very first one, uh, like I said, it was copyright infringement. So there is this old lady named Abby. She's like a first grade teacher. And uh, she had her first graders making drawings of this character from her childhood, Gumshoe Gooper, who is like a just a, a fish detective of some kind. And then she posted them on her Hypnospace blog, right? But here's the problem. She doesn't own Gumshoe Gooper. It's not her character. She is violating the copyright of the people who own Gumshoe Gooper. So, uh, as, as an enforcer, I think is the exact title, as a member of the HSPD, it is our role to take down all those pictures. And we only needed to find, like, I think it was six, but there's a lot more on there. So I just, I took them all down. Now that already in itself, you could be asking, like, well, is it is it really a problem? Like, are they really violating the copyright of the character of Gumshoe Gooper? Like, is this really the thing that people on Hypnospace, like people online moderating, should be spending their time on? And that's and that like turns into a real question, like a real world legit question about like online moderation. Uh, you know, of all the issues, of all the terrible things that could be happening online, is is like fan art really something that's worth policing and i think people would tend to find probably not but then it goes even deeper right so another feature that you learned about like in the tutorial uh that enforcers have is uh the ability to flag users uh and actually for the video folks i'm just i'm realizing here that i'm probably going to be putting in gameplay like if only if only as an excuse for me to like record some of the game because i can just record this straight on the computer i don't know how great the frame rate's going to be as a result of me trying to play a game and having um the software over it but you know we'll, we'll see what happens um uh the, so as a result of incurring so many copyright violations one thing that the players can choose to do is to flag Abby's account. And what flagging an account does is it it allows uh, the people in charge of Hypnospace, it allows the HSPD to essentially like look at her account and decide, well, should we just ban it permanently? And now I don't think, I think certain accounts, like certain uh, cases force you to flag uh, users like in that second case I mentioned in Teentopia where the one teen is bullying another teen the the goal like the thing that you're told to do as a player is to 
flag that user. Not so you not, not just take down his his bullying, but also you have to flag him, right? So, but you can choose to flag Abby. And like I said, I don't think it, it, she'll actually get taken down because it's all a story driven game. Um, but but I could choose to do that. So the question is, well, you know, she's got she's Abby has received enough like hypnospace violations to justify being flagged on paper. But for what she's done, would it be moral for me as an enforcer, knowing that like morally believing that copyright violation, like in the grand scheme of like considering all the other things that I can go after, like harassment, like actual illegal things, like viruses and malicious software, is, is it, is it morally correct for me to take her down? And, and people are going to arrive at different conclusions on that issue. You know, I would say that it's probably, I don't think it's worth, um, like, flagging her. Other people might just be of the opinion that, no, flat, you did all this, you did these things that are considered, like, violations of, of policy. Yeah, we're going to flag your account and you might get banned. Um, I don't. I don't think there's necessarily one right or wrong answer to that in in an objective sense. I would, but I would tend to find myself like in in Abby's case being a little more sympathetic. Uh, in the case of somebody who is uh, putting out illegal content or uh, malicious software, yeah, I'm I'm much more willing to like drop the ban hammer on them. But uh, you know, pe people will all feel differently on all of those, and I think that's a that's a very it's the kind of theme that you can only really explore through a game and have it be like extra levels of effective, in my opinion, you know, uh, I think you could, ex I think there could be a similar theme explored in a, in a book, for example, I think this can make an interesting sort of a, a book, right. To see what a moderator goes through, uh, in making these sorts of decisions. But these questions become way more personal and they hit you a lot harder, or at least they hit me a lot harder, as a result of being the person who has to make that choice. I have the ability to hover my mouse over the button that says flag, and I get to decide Abby's fate to one extent or another. You know, even though the game obviously predetermines what's going to really happen, um, I still, I have that choice. I, in, on paper, I could, I could realistically make this happen. Uh, if, if this were the real world. So I have to consider whether or not it's moral to do so. And I, I, I applaud the game for that. So those are the sorts of things that I got to study in that paper. Overall, I want to say I found the class incredibly enjoyable. Uh, the person who was like in our discussion section, we, we uh, essentially every uh, week there were different groups leading discussions on the topics we were talking about in, uh, in the lecture that week. Um, those were really fun. Again, the week that I was sick that I could have recorded the one debate episode was also just happened to be the week that I would have presented with my group. So I, I had to do that remotely, which is a shame. I was pretty upset about that, but you know, it all went up, ended up going just fine. Um, and I, we also had to do a presentation that was essentially based on our paper and I'd already gotten to do that. And that was enjoyable. I even went so far because this is a game that, that I was talking about that simulates 1999. I was like, I am going to download just because I'm crazy enough to do this. I'm going to download themes for PowerPoint, for the most recent version of PowerPoint to that year. So I've downloaded, like, you know, I went on the Internet Archive and found, like, probably 150 different Office 97 <laughs> PowerPoint themes. Uh, you know, that I don't I don't know how often I'm going to be able to use them, but I was just like, you know, I need, I, I need them for this presentation because I am getting into character here. This is like a little dramatic show. I need the presentation to fit the aesthetic of the 90s so and the best part i didn't i wasn't sure if this would work but the themes are all compatible with modern day microsoft powerpoint and that, that was just the icing on the cake that i could still use in an old like 20 almost 25 year old like microsoft powerpoint theme on the modern PowerPoint for the presentation I gave about that game. And I was just, I just, I had so much fun in, in that class, you know, no class is perfect. There are definitely aspects that I thought like, um, could have gone better. Uh, but I, overall looking back on it, I had a, I had a ton of fun and surprise, surprise, the class that, you know, it is about video games and learning two things that I'm very passionate about was probably my favorite one of the semester. 
And now we get into uh, editing and post-production. So um, one thing that I could have received if I decided, oh, you know, I want to spend more money and do more school, which I really don't want to do. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm at a place where I'm like, I want to pause some education. I've been doing this for years. I want a job. Uh, but I could have received this like uh, digital cinema production certificate. Uh, but the the way they structured the certificate basically meant you had to do it over like three or four semesters, and it was just it was ridiculous. But one class I wanted to make sure I took over my time that would have been related to that was editing and post production because I've really enjoyed video editing. In fact, I think I've talked on here about like editing is really my favorite part of um, producing media. And funnily enough, as a result of taking that class, I think what I've come to realize is maybe I was wrong on that. Uh, and, and it's not to say that the class was like, no, I hate editing. No, no, no. I would still tend to rank, like, I would still tend to say that actually my least favorite part of working on media is actually pre-production. Uh, you know, I, it, I, you have to do it regardless, but I just, I can, I find I can get very easily bogged down in pre-production where it's like, I just, I want to make things sort of like perfect. Um, but I digress. I think what I realized is really it's like main production. What I'm doing right now, for example, as far as making a podcast, this is my favorite part is the actual act of speaking and recording it. Um, the act of writing notes, uh, can, it can get kind of boring. It can take a long time. It's just, it's, but I have to do it and it's fine. I, I still enjoy doing it. It's not like I despise it, but in the in ranking the three parts of the process, it's my least favorite part. And, and that's okay. You know, something has to be, something always has to be the bottom, even if it's not um, bad necessarily, right? Um, and similarly, I I felt that, I, I, I realized, like I said, the production is probably my favorite part. I enjoy doing this. It's simple. I'm sitting here, I'm talking. In the case of a film, uh, what I realized, the reason I enjoyed it so much is, um, there's, there's something that's really fun about, okay, I have this list of shots that I want to get, and I need to figure out, like, I'm, I'm challenging myself to figure out how to get the camera to do what I want it to do, the way that I need it done. I'm going to get to do it a few different times to see what's the best uh, shot I can get out of it. Whereas in editing, now I get to choose which one of those is actually the best. Which one did I enjoy the most? Which one creates the best feeling that I want? And really the problem in the editing class for me is just there are certain um, practices in editing that, you know, I just I don't necessarily agree with. And that's fine. You know, uh, like we spend a decent amount of time on sound. Shocker. You know, you also need sound with your video. Right. And so, you know, being someone who does podcasts, I think about sound quite a bit. And one practice that we had in the class uh, that I learned is actually kind of debated amongst uh, professionals in the in the sound space is what is the proper sort of way to normalize audio so in the class we were tasked with everything needs to hit uh, negative 12 decibels or at least the, all the dialogue needs to hit negative 12 decibels at the highest and I don't think that's necessarily bad but I was just I I'm not so much a fan of that because, as you know, I mean, if you'll, if you wanted to download this piece of audio, right, you you download this podcast, you'll probably I, I haven't edited the, the I have not edited this show yet as I'm speaking it here, but you know I I, I think I like to target around like negative six decibels as the top, uh, not negative twelve. Um, and so, again, some will debate, some will be like, it should be negative 10 is the top. Some will be like, uh, negative three is the top. Like people, people are all over the place. There's really not one set audio level that's supposed to be this. It should be this height. Although people just say never hit zero because zero clips and zero is bad. Right. Um, so I just, I didn't, I wasn't so much a fan of let's make all the audio hit negative 12 DB, uh, which again is decibels because, you're not really getting the real variety of how loud dialogue is. You know, uh, a moment where a character in the film that we were editing, where they're whispering and they're really quiet, probably shouldn't be hitting negative 12 dB. And at the same, on the same token, a moment where a character is yelling, and that was just my fake pretend, like I'm going to sound like I'm yelling, but you know, a moment where they really, truly are, like, actually yelling, well, that should probably hit closer to negative six, maybe even negative four or five dB, because, well, they're speaking louder, they should sound 
louder. And then, yeah, sure, if you want the main moments where they're talking to be negative 12, like, I, I would bet most of the audio here is going to be negative 12, uh, or at least in that general range, because that's kind of what I'm targeting right now. I mean, I'm, I'm live monitoring this as I'm recording it, but yeah, the loudest bits, like, they should be louder, and the quieter bits should be quieter, and that's okay. Like, I, that was just, that was one practice. I was like, eh, I don't really, mm, I don't, I don't agree with this. And, you know, that's fine. That's just kind of the process of making creative works is like, as different creatives, you're going to disagree on, on certain aspects. Um, but as far as like the main process of editing, um, we learned like a lot about using keyboard shortcuts, uh, for example, and there were definitely a many keyboard shortcuts that I learned that were very helpful. Uh, in our case, we used Adobe Premiere. Um, if I really like had my druthers, that would be what I would use here, like for my own work as well. But I don't have a powerful enough computer yet. Actually, that's something that I I would really hope to get. Like uh, that that would be my ideal sort of graduation gift is uh, a, a computer that I can like make video stuff on, like and edit it with proper power. Uh, but I digress. Um, I, I would use Premiere if I if I had the kind of money to just like I'm gonna have a two hundred and fifty dollar uh, Adobe Creative Cloud subscription that I pay every year. Uh, you know I'm not I don't use a ton of different like streaming, so I could I honestly could probably afford that if I if I tried because um, I I, don't, I get I get randomly I only have like one thing or so that I'd ever want to watch on a streaming service at any one point. So I'd, I can't foresee myself spending like a ton on TV or anything. But again, I'm, I'm getting off track here. Uh, like, I, like I said, we learned a lot of sh keyboard shortcuts. We learned a lot of practices on like how to use Premiere. And, but I wasn't a fan quite of all the keyboard shortcuts. Like it almost seemed like at certain points as if like we should be doing everything on the keyboard. And... I, I, that's just not how editing works. Like, you know, I'm fine learning, like, oh, I can drag a piece of, or I can um, click on a piece of footage, double click on it, and it'll come up in this one window on the upper left of my uh, Premiere, like a uh, like full bigger window, right? And I can use I to create an in point, O to create an out point to basically just make the cuts for me with the keyboard. And then I can drag it into the timeline and have it be how I want it to be. And I actually, I like that. I learned that. I, I didn't know about that before. I thought, oh, this is this is actually really good. I appreciate this. I learned about the shuttle keys, J, K, and L. So J will um, rewind a piece of footage and L will fast forward through a piece of footage. And that made going through things a lot faster. Uh, we also learned about doing things like... Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what they're called, but like you'd take every piece of footage from like a bin and like have to watch it through. And that was a practice that like I appreciated, but man, was it time consuming. Uh, it, like it would just take so much time to figure out like the pieces of footage that I would use. And in the end, I thought like that was a, that's a good like starting practice, but it ended up, but I feel like in the long run, it's not always the best thing in the sense that I would I, I would find myself changing my mind on pieces of footage later on and just like for the kinds of things that I do because I'm not I'm not working on <laughs> I'm not working on Hollywood type films right now uh, it's not necessarily the way that I would probably choose to do things you know like I, I, it's probably a practice that I could even still do in um, current in like the kinds of projects that I would do um, I'm not saying it's like a oh, terrible horrible thing but it, it just took, it took a lot of time and there were definitely days where I was like oh my goodness I'm just I'm watching through all this footage and I'm like I'm, I'm gonna start falling asleep on it granted that's also because the films that we had weren't necessarily the greatest uh that we were editing but uh you know it, 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 was, it was a learning experience um and I'm, I guess what I'm saying is if these are the practices like in professional editing rooms it kind of I kind of changed my mind on well would I want to do this as a job potentially but also maybe not like i've changed my mind on some of that and that's fine um but you know i i also realized like i can i can learn my own ways of doing things and and, and that's fine too so again just very informative uh i suppose i should talk about the pieces that we worked on so we only worked on one scene from uh one final student film and then we worked on the entirety of a different uh, final student film so the way that like the communication arts program works for like film tv students is they ultimately end up taking a, ca a capstone course where they get to make about a half hour length short film and 
I don't think I'm I, the the copyright stuff on it is kind of weird and like I'm allowed to distribute my edit of one of the one scene I did from the one film and one scene from the film where I edited the whole thing, but I'm not really I'm not allowed to like distribute my entire edit. I don't even I don't even have access to that edit or the footage anymore, so it wouldn't really matter anyway. Uh, but man, the problem in both films because we we actually got to end up we had access to the whole scripts so the scripts even before they shot what they shot so first off what they shot didn't entirely follow the scripts in the end because i mean some of the things they just weren't going to be able to get as a result of what they wrote uh they just it would take like some of them would like require having live animals and some would require having like weapons and i don't know if they were able to have access to those things but the problem wasn't even necessarily that sort of stuff. The problem, in general, I found to be the writing for each. Like, the 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 plots felt like they had certain plot holes. Uh, the plots felt like they kind of got, like, crazy at certain points. Like, the film that I, we ended up just doing the one scene of. Um, everybody was watching, like, their footage through, and they are like, man, these two, these two characters here, they clearly feel like they, they like each other, like, maybe, you know, and there's this kid, maybe, maybe they're the parents of this child, but then why would this one, like, it seemed like they were a couple, but the guy in the conversation, he had to leave, so, like, maybe they're not, maybe, maybe they're just their lovers or something now, um, and then come to find, as, as I read the whole script, no, 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 it's way, it's way something, like, totally different from that. Uh, it's actually the woman was married to the man in this in this conversation in the scene we got to edit. He is the brother of her dead husband. So then it gets like, well, why? Well, hold on. Why do they have this sort of like relationship tension going on right now? Like, I totally get, you know, if I had a sibling that died and who was married to someone else, I would, I would, you know, want to be there to like support them. But I, I also probably would not like. Uh, uh, sort of even like have the the feeling of like some sort of uh, romantic or sexual tension right i would just think that's i would just think it's a little weird maybe that's just me i don't know um but yeah and, then, and they end up uh more or less getting together at the end of the movie and i was just like what like how about this? but this film was like about the, the guy and being upset and they're all upset about the, his brother or in the case of the woman her husband he's dead and like what why why does this end up with them getting like why do they <sighs> it's crazy again i don't i don't know if i'm i would assume i'm allowed to talk about the actual films on here but i don't really want to like flame the films and how bad their writing is in my opinion but i was just like whoa 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 both of the the movies that we edited Either whether it's just this one scene for that one that I just talked about, or the whole, the entirety of the other, I felt like both needed another, another, like just just another pass through the writing phase for each of them, uh, because these are just things that I was like, I cannot believe that anybody at any point was not like, I don't know about this idea in your writing, guys, but you know, I also, I also, again, I can't act like my writing is just amazing, perfect, so. Maybe, maybe I would have written something if I was in their shoes that would not necessarily be uh, the best either. And again, that's okay, but oh boy, I was just, I, I was not the only one who was like really critical of what they wrote too when I described it to people or like when they read it, they were like, what the heck was that? What the heck is that ending? You're like, well, how does that resolve their problems? Like, this is, this is talk about the other film, the one that I haven't described just now. The one that we actually edited the whole thing about was, like, about this band of brothers and, uh, you know, the one, like, their dad died and the youngest brother left and, and somehow at the film, the end of the movie, they're all supposed to get back together because the youngest brother, like, they got in an argument and then the youngest brother, like leaves and he kills a deer or like he shoots a deer and then they decide to like mercy kill the deer because the youngest brother shot it and now they all love each other again like how does like i just i didn't quite understand that ending like is they were they're just kind of weird movies like again they're not bad but i just i didn't 
A did not ex explicitly lead to B, in my opinion, uh, so to speak, in either of those films. Um, and so editing them kind of became like, what am I working on here? When I was after having read, um, read through them, because it's like this scene here, like it clearly obviously leads to this next one, but it also feels like it shouldn't at the same time because there's this other issue in this scene that doesn't seem like it's really been properly resolved, but I guess we're moving on anyway. Um, but yeah, and, and as far as like actual lessons from the class that I took um, about like how films should be put together, uh, we talked a lot, we talked a lot about like what should you prioritize in your editing. Um, especially using this book by, uh, uh, who's apparently a pretty famous editor, you know, I mean, he only like, helped edit on the godfather right you know only considered one of the movies that's like one of the greatest of all time he only helped edit on that right uh walter murch and the way that he prioritizes editing is like emotion should come first then performance uh i can't remember explicitly the la the rest after that but for sure at the bottom this probably would shock a lot of people but the bottom is continuity because really what matters to viewers is is getting a certain uh, feeling from what they're what they're watching, right? And, and you know that that just makes sense in the end. I was like, oh, you know, I, I can see I can see how that would uh, I can see how that would be the case, uh, even if like it sort of confuses me in sort of confused me in my head. It's because you know you can you, you won't even notice a continuity error if you are caught up in the emotion like there was a the the 12th scene of the of, of of that second film i described the one about the three brothers um i could have left in this continuity error but it just it kind of bugged me so much i was like eh, i also have another take that i think gives it similar enough feeling to where i can take that out and it also didn't help the continuity error it wasn't just a visual error it's also an audio error um I, I don't know. I struggle. I think I, I think I could have gotten away with it, but I'm not so. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's where uh, the 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 three brothers are all getting up for the day, right? And the youngest brother is getting a pot of coffee and he's pouring it, and then you hear it go like back on back on the like the coffee pot stand. It makes it makes a sound. Uh, and so I have one clip i had one clip of like people like viewing behind him and he's setting down the pot of coffee and then uh but in the next shot when i would cut out to see like the young the youngest brother and the oldest brother talking about something then the youngest brother who's pouring a cup of coffee sets the coffee pot back down again and it, go, and it makes the same sort of like clinking noise so I was like, ah, you know, I could I could probably get away with this, but it's just, it's just bugging me enough. But you know, if if I went with entirely through Merch's mindset, I should I should have just kept it because I thought that the rest of the shots were absolutely perfect for what I was doing. But again, I think I found a, a similar equivalent. I was like, no, this this gives me the same feeling, and it gets rid of that error that's bugging me. So, but other like there were definitely like there were later scenes like a really really tough one was like almost half of the set like we we f edited the big movie this movie about the three brothers in two separate parts over the course of the semester so in the second half of the film uh there was one really long scene this is the scene where they argue that i was talking about like got in this argument and then the younger brother like runs away uh didn't the film like the actual filmed version didn't end up with him killing a deer thank goodness um but um during the argument bit like there is a whole portion of uh, that scene that I just cut out because I was like, this really isn't that important. Like, there's a bit where the eldest brother calls the youngest brother. Like, he says he's acting like a baby. And I was like, no, you don't really need that. But it, it it would cause different, like, it would cause people to, like, jump around a little bit. And I would show it to my peers. And they're like, no, no, this is fine. Like, I didn't even notice that that had happened after I pointed that out. So, like, yeah, continuity. People think it's really important. And, you know, I don't want to pretend like it has no importance or it's like it doesn't matter at all, but you can get away with a lot of continuity errors if if you have a really a really compelling film. And I think that was a, a pretty eye-opening lesson uh, for me to be like, wow, I can, like, you know, I, I can make a film that, you know, isn't complete perfect continuity, but it, it, it gets the message across. And in the end, that's, that's what really matters is that people get 
the message, I suppose. Uh, let's see. How about uh, how about this structure of English class? Uh, I kind of feel like that class this semester was sort of like the most. I don't want to say generic, but it's like the. It was like exactly what I would expect a college class to to be like from the rest of the ones I took. Like all the rest were just they were a little different in some way, uh, somehow. Whereas this was just like, uh, you know, we would we'd have a topic for a week. We'd have three lectures on it. We'd go to class. We'd have a thing we'd need to read uh, before we go to class. Um, and then we'd have an assignment and then a couple exams. And, uh, I mean, we had a paper and a project to do at the end. That ended up being kind of weird, but it just was what it was. I wouldn't say I adored the class. I wouldn't say I hated the class. But, you know, I, I, I was like, I, enjoy, I enjoyed what I did. I enjoyed what I learned. Uh, there's something very meta about learning uh syntax i realized uh where it's like you know i don't really think about how sentences get put together but when you see them put together like there's there's just something that like when you read a sentence that is obviously incorrectly put together and it just seems off that's just very intuitive like honestly i think that was the big lesson for the class is like a lot of things like a lot of what we learned seemed in completely intuitive. And I think, and obviously that's just because I speak and I write and I have learned English my entire life. Um, so it's just like, oh, the order of words, that all makes sense. We learned how to like diagram sentences in trees, uh, which is something that you would need if you're going to be a real linguist. Um, but obviously it's something that I would not suspect I will be doing uh, any uh, time past the class is like reading a sentence and figuring out, oh, this is how things all go together. Uh, again, it was interesting, not necessarily the most applicable, but it's like that, that was kind of the point of me taking the classes because I thought, oh, I want to, I, I think it would be interesting to learn how sentences go together and kind of compare them. Uh, for example, how sentences go together in other languages too. Um, for that final project, like I said, I felt like that was kind of the most frustrating aspect of the, the the class overall. But it was partially because of the way that my partner and I set things up. So it was, you know, it was kind of my own fault. Uh, we had we what we had to do is we had to um, each listen to like twenty minutes of people to uh, listen to twenty minutes of like people speaking, um, and they had to code switch during their speech. So, like, you'd have, uh, so, you know, you have two people in conversation, um, they're, they, they're each able to speak different languages, and at some point, they will, like, switch maybe on a word, or a phrase, or, like, a, a full sentence, or, like, even a paragraph over to another language, and then be able to switch back at different points, right? And... I should also point out, we, we also learned a lot about phrases in the class. So, like, I bring up phrases if they're, like, different from words. Um, but what the professor would contend is that, no, actually, they're, they're, like, different types of word, like, phrases. Like, you have noun phrases and verb phrases. And obviously, I, I mean, I agree with it. That's kind of what I learned. Um, but it, it's the way that, like, actual language works is not necessarily, even though, the, like, it comes out being intuitive in the end, like, getting there is kind of non-intuitive. Um, but I digress. Uh, for this project, like I said, we, we had the opportunity to, um, we could eat if we wanted to, if we could somehow do it, we could listen to like, like actually view two people talk for 20 minutes each, uh, with their consent. And as far as listening in, we could watch a video or a few videos on this that added up to 20 minutes each. Um, or what we could do, what I wanted to do which was not necessarily the best decision, but I think could have worked out if, like, I had done even more searching, even though I'd already actually done a pretty decent amount of searching before I arrived on what we did, um, which is listen to podcasts, because, I mean, I make podcasts. I love podcasts. I love I love listening to conversations. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. I have the option to do podcasts. I want to do podcasts. We can do podcasts. He was like, whatever. I mean, he, like, I, I, I give a lot of credit to the guy who was my partner for that project. He's, he's a pretty uh, go with the flow on, uh, on a lot of stuff like that. Um, so we ended up listening to this podcast by these two, uh, these two ladies, uh, called Bilingual Buzz. Um, and it was a good idea, except for one pretty important little, uh, problem that, uh, we had, which is, uh, the podcast Bilingual Buzz 
is hosted by these two ladies who speak English and Japanese. And I don't have, obviously, I don't have any problem with Japanese other than the fact that I don't speak it. Neither of us speak that language. So it kind of made data collection a little bit more of a challenge uh, for what we had set up uh, because we don't speak the language. So like, if for comparison, if we had done maybe like a Spanish that I do speak, como español, por ejemplo, uh, the project would have gone a lot easier because I could be like, oh, that's that particular kind of word, even if my partner, I don't, I don't think he said that he spoke Spanish. I actually don't know what other um, languages he uh, learned, if, if any, uh, over the course of his education. Um, I assume, well, I think one of the requirements for graduation for us was to take some amount of foreign language. So there had to be one, but but I'm getting, again, I'm getting a little off track here. I, I, I ramble sometimes. Uh, if, if we had gone with a language that either of us had necessarily known... Man, would it have made doing that a lot easier. So there definitely there was definitely some fudging of the numbers as far as like, well, based on the way this English sentence goes, it would only make sense for this sentence to start with X, Y, or Z type of word. Uh, so we we could only make data on like what are our well, what are we semi confident in saying this is, um, which was a challenge. Uh, but even then, like looking at the podcasts that were out there, um, and maybe this is just the limitation of me having an Android phone and going onto Google Podcasts, whereas if I was on an iPhone and on Apple Podcasts, I would have found something different. Or maybe if I looked on Spotify or some other service, I would have found uh, better better shows. Uh, again, not that the show is bad. I actually found their conversations to be uh, pretty entertaining, uh, all things considered. Uh, but I just I didn't understand the language. Whereas maybe if I had found something that again was in a language that either one of us have known would have known, uh, we could have had a, a, a better time. But shockingly, a lot of the podcasts that were out there that followed this sort of bilingual uh, format where uh, the hosts would code switch, there was a lot of English and like an East Asian language like that. So like there there were a couple that were Japanese. I think I saw one that was like Korean um, as well. It was that I found kind of surprising. Like I couldn't find any in my research that were um, uh, two different sort, sorts of uh, like a romantic language and a, a Germanic uh, language like English. So I, I don't know. I just I found it surprising. But again, your results may vary if you, for whatever reason, want to do a similar thing to like to to like. Wow. Am I Elma Fudd to like what uh, him and I did? Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, regardless, I, I appreciate the fact that that podcast was uh, was out there for us to get that data from, even if we didn't exactly ma have things go perfectly uh because we're not uh, experts on that language, but it was it was a fun project in the end. I'm glad we got it done. Honestly, the 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 thing that the the piece of it that ended up being the most frustrating for us was the paper. Uh, like there's not there's not a ton of collaborative papers <laughs> that people get to write, and um, that was one of the few. And like figuring out how to put all the things we needed. Um, was a was a bit of a, a challenge like there 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 were definitely a couple times in like in the paper writing process not even so much in any other not even during not during the research process not during the ideation process not during the presentation making process because we had to make a presentation first for the paper that we were going to write which actually is, we found kind of helpful because on paper the presentation should act as like a de facto outline for our like final uh, piece of writing uh we didn't really have any problems with that, but there are definitely a couple times where it's like, all right, we we got to go in the back now because <laughs> we were just getting like frustrated. I mean, we didn't actually fight, but I'm just saying like we got frustrated with each other during the the writing process. And, you know, it's c'est la vie. It is uh, sometimes that's just how life goes, but got it turned in, got a good grade. Things are good now. We're both graduated, like thumbs up uh, across the board. Uh, speaking of writing, though, I think we should talk a little bit about legal writing. So... Uh, when I signed up for classes last fall for this final semester, I remember looking up like what kinds of courses I could take. And I remember seeing this one. And I was like, um, when I read it, I don't know if I just don't pay attention or if like the way I read it made it sound different in my head than what I actually ended up getting. Uh, but when I thought about legal research and writing, and I guess to me, it sounded more about like just like a legal writing itself. I guess I envisioned more like oh, this is how politicians, because it was also considered a poli-sci class, this is how politicians write statutes. They write laws, right? Well, I was very wrong. Uh, legal research and writing ended up being, like, about lawyering, lawyery research and writing. Uh, 
which I found very interesting. I was like, and one one of the things that the, the, the professor talked about in the class a couple of times when like sort of meta talking about the class itself is this class is going to be a good barometer for you if you think you want to go to law school. Like if you end up enjoying what we did, if you don't end up enjoying it, it's going to end up being a, a sign either like you would enjoy doing law school, you'd enjoy being a lawyer or the opposite, right? Or vice versa, you could say. And um, usually with classes, and I, I mentioned this on the other podcast a few times too, when people would talk about like their interest in being a lawyer. And I was like, oh, you should take this class that I'm taking right now then. Um, usually with the courses I would take, uh, obviously I said this last semester, I would have a pretty good handle on, I'm going to really like this course or I'm, I'm, ooh, I'm really not liking this course. And this was a class where, like, I could not decide for the life of me. Like, I was, on, or I could, I couldn't figure out, like, do I really like what I'm doing here or not? I was always kind of in the middle the entire time because, again, looking at things from like a, a big picture view, I I enjoyed the content. I enjoyed learning about this is how lawyers do research. I enjoyed learning about like this is how they write. I enjoyed the lectures. Um, I was kind of eh about the readings. I mean, reading legal opinions are so, so long. Uh, and it's, it's just like lawyers don't get to, like judges don't get to the point when they write, which was something that we learned that we uh, focused on in the class is when you do legal writing, you should try to be concise. Um, which is why a lot of re legal writing is frustrating because they're not very concise, but I digress. Uh, because legal issues are complicated um, and hard to put into necessary, like, uh, man, they're hard to put into short words. Um, but it was really the actual assignments themselves, the things that you would do as a lawyer that I found to be the least enjoyable parts of the class. Which, um, you know, the, the, the problem is when you're a lawyer, these are kind of the first, these are, these are the first few things you do as an attorney. Like in your first few years as an attorney, you're pretty much the person writing like objective legal memos for prospective clients and doing research on like what cases say and finding the best ones. And you're doing persuasive briefs for lawyers who actually end up going to present. And like, you don't actually get to, like people think that lawyering is all about going to court and advocating. And that's obviously part of it, but that's really not most of the job. Most of the job is figuring out, like crafting the arguments for cases and, um, you know, I, I also can't act like I set myself up necessarily the best for these because of the way that other classes went, like especially the next one we're going to be talking about, which is creative writing, recall. Uh, I didn't, I wouldn't say I set myself up with the most amount of time necessarily to work on some of these tasks. So it's it's hard for me to be objective and say that, yes, I got the best experience that I could have in this to determine whether or not I would like this um, as a whole career sort of thing. Uh but even that notwithstanding, there are also certain, kind of like how I said there are practices that I wasn't so sure about in the editing uh, class. There are also certain, there are also certain aspects of legal writing that are just like, that I found to be kind of like uh, irritating. So like one thing that I, I talk about a lot on here, and obviously I, I just talked about a similar thing earlier here is I really, 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 really go for intuitive arguments. If I can like explain something to someone in the easiest, most basic way possible, to where like they can, they can be completely uninformed and understand what I'm getting at, that is ideal to me. In legal writing, you don't necessarily have that. Uh, you know, you have to go based on like what what does past case law say? If past case law doesn't go in your favor, now you have to come up with an argument for like, this is why I should, you sh I should win this, even though case law isn't necessarily in my favor. Uh, you know, so I'm gonna kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of come up with something that's a little screwy here, but it still leads to my final conclusion. And it's not necessarily the most convincing, but I'm going to try for it. Um, and I, I just, I find that frustrating because man, I like, Again, like all legal arguments aren't necessarily like perfectly ethical arguments. <laughs> uh, sometimes you have to advocate for people that you're not necessarily in agreement with on uh, certain issues, especially in civil cases. Um, like the the we, we had these two fictional cases for like our, our objective legal memo and our um, our persuasive uh, uh, brief, right? And 
I, 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 with the, the persuasive brief, I remember opening it thinking, cause I was, I was on the defendant side. I got to, I got to be Mr. Mr. Phoenix, right? Right. <laughs> uh, and I, when, when, when I first read just like the case facts and the stuff that was presented to us before we even got the, uh, got like cases that we could review for, for research or like did some research on like cases that could be in our, in, in support of our position. I remember thinking, ah, you know, I could really go, if I were a judge, I could go either way on this. Um, but then I found as I did more research and started like writing my piece, I, I, I actually became more in favor of the, of the defendant, even though, I don't know, I, I also think that if I were on the plaintiff's side on the case, it was a defamation case, I should just point out, um, a pretend sort of defamation case where it's like, oh, this lady was one of the first people with COVID and she's talked about it on Twitter and some news personality was like, who's skeptical, like who's basically a COVID skeptic was like, oh, she's faking it. Like I said, this didn't necessarily happen in real life. Um, but, you know, I had to be, uh, I had to advocate for the defendant and basically show, no, he did not defame her for reasons X, Y, and Z. So like one of the things we had to come up with um is like one of the things you had to argue is was the plaintiff a public figure uh and so like i would think it's pretty intuitive that somebody who's just rando on twitter even if she has like 500 twitter followers and is making a tweet no that that she's not a public figure i would very much doubt that she's a public figure uh but i somehow because i had to do this prove that she is in this case uh for like the place you're arguing for is like we were in we're pretending this is in texas uh, and according to texas law you can be a limited purpose public figure. So like you can be a public figure for a particular event so because she's one of the first people with covid i was like well for this reason she has to be a limited purpose public figure and because she wants to advocate for people like following covid restrictions like again it's just it's not very intuitive what's way more intuitive is just saying to most people she would not be a public figure for the purposes of this event, because there, like, at in March of 2020, there are going to be fewer than even a thousand people who have ever had COVID-19. She kind of be, has to become a, a a public figure, at least just for this particular instance. Like to me, that just sounds way more intuitive than like the way that I have to go through all this and just citation in legal writing. Uh, there's just, there's so much citation. Like it felt like every single sentence I would write, I would have to come, I would have to create a citation, even if I was just like reiterating different points and it's just, ugh. it just, it screwed me up as like a, a writer who's just not used to doing, who's like, I'm just, I'm going to make an argument. Uh, and I'm going to cite when I have evidence that I'm citing to like my assertions shouldn't automatically require, um, citations when, uh, that they're just they're my assertions based on the evidence like it's it just it frustrated me but like i said i i think i think in a world where i had perhaps set myself up with more time to work on some of these uh pieces earlier and uh, i had uh, had less frustration in making them i probably would have enjoyed the class more so it's tough for me to say like did i really come to the end of this concluding i was like nah i don't know if law school is for me because of how i did things or is it because of the actual process itself even though obviously i just identified the level of citation and like the constant sort of citation that goes on even for things that i think are plainly obvious um was frustrating uh, i don't know if that alone is sufficient for me to say that no i wouldn't enjoy a law school so i, st I still have like kind of left that door open but I, I think I've been pushed a little bit away from it, which is a shame because I think I, th I, th I think there is still something there. Like if people think I would be um, a good lawyer, I think it, it, it wouldn't hurt to at least like try it out. But, you know, at the moment, like I said, I, I just I want, I want to push. I want, I want to try something else. Maybe, maybe I'll come back to it in the future. Um, and my experiences in that class kind of lead me toward thinking, nah, I, uh, I just I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I would like it or or not. Oh boy. Oh boy. Creative writing. So, uh, full disclosure here, you know, I needed one more class when it came to picking classes for this final semester. And like I said, I just kind of wanted to pick stuff, stuff that I thought I would enjoy. I thought I would enjoy creative writing. And then, you know, in the end, I, I would say I generally enjoyed it. But I, I thought it would probably be the easiest class. 
And boy, boy, oh boy, was I wrong. So, so very wrong. Um, we had one meeting every week, one two hour every, one two hour meeting on Mondays. We would workshop pieces that we wrote. First off, I should point out this is also poetry and fiction. So the first half of the semester we focused on poetry. The second semester we focused on writing short fiction. I wouldn't say I hate poetry. I'm not really a big fan of poetry though. Poetry is not really my thing. I think poetry can get a little too flowery. I think people can like read a little too deeply into poetry and can just get confusing. And I just, I'm not. I'm just. I'm not a big poetry person. Um, but we spent a lot of time on poetry and poetry practices, so already I was kind of like, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know. But then it was really the ex the extent of the work that I wasn't prepared for. Um, like we had to read uh, examples and essays about creative writing every week. Okay, that's fine. We have one meeting. I can do that. We had to write like a, an, an additional assignment. Okay, that sounds fine too. It was really providing feedback on people's like pieces that they were workshopping that became the problem. And that probably sounds a little weird like for people who really know me because I mean, I'm going all the way back to like the start of this podcast. I talked a lot about, or, well, I didn't say I talked a lot, but the start of this, sh this episode I talked about when I did debate, I love judging because I like, I think it, providing feedback is incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable to people. Uh, I think the feedback process is like, just like, I cannot overstate how important it is. So why would I not be a fan of the feedback processes for on poetry and in pieces of fiction that people are writing for their workshops? That probably sounds a little strange to people who, who, who know me, at least somewhat decently. Well, it's because I had to do it twice. So let me explain. Um, people every week would submit, like a, a group of a group of five people would submit a poem, right? So I had to provide feedback on five poems, which is already a, a lot. Uh, and then, of course, later in the semester, those same groups would, like, they would get broken down. I, like, I think technically somewhere, like, there were really groups of three and a group of two, so it'd be, like, for poetry, we would just do two do different, like, groups each week. So that way we could have each individual group go for their fiction weeks because, uh, obviously, their fiction pieces could like, would be, like, you know, upwards of five, maybe 10 to 15 pages for some people, whereas their poems are like one page, 14 lines long. Um, and instead of like, what well, well, we had to do for the feedback is first we had to go through and write comments on the poems or the pieces of fiction. Okay, that's fine. I love doing that. I've already done that many times. But then we have to take that again and write a whole letter about our feedback to the writer that just kind of reiterates what we wrote in the comments. So it'd be like, I'd have to go through and I'd have to read a piece. So first I'd probably just read it cold. Then I have to read it through again and give it comments. And, you know, I, I like to be very measured, very, like, um, detailed in my comments, which, I mean, obviously that's my own problem. I could have just written, I, I could have gone with, like, kind of very substanceless um, comments and then wrote re truly substantive letters, but it's like, no, I'm going to give very substantive comments and then I'm going to write a letter that's going to be the same sort of substance and it'll just be like something that if I just done, that if we were just allowed to do one or the other, either just write a letter or just write comments on these pieces, it would be doing this so much more enjoyable. Something could have been done in like 20 minutes per poem and like maybe like 20 minutes per piece of fiction ended up taking at least double the amount of time. And this is for multiple people every week, on top of all the other things you had to do for the class, on top of all the other things that we were doing all the time. And providing the comments and the letters was like the most important thing. So it'd be like, I'd get behind on doing the other stuff for the class because I'd spend so much time doing like really, truly effective feedback for people. And it just drove me nuts. And it was, again, it was just, it was every week, it was all the time. And this was a class that I thought should have been fun. Especially because I, I ended up, I mean, I, you know, the poems I thought that I wrote, I thought they were fine. But the, the fiction piece I wrote, I was really proud of. Of course, I, I took, I took inspiration from my, my, my beloved uh, Ace Attorney, right? And I, and I, I wrote sort of a, a let me, let me make a, a, a piece of writing that's a little bit more like traditional, um, like American trial system. And I want to, I want to just make a piece on that, but it's like with a similarly ridiculous sort of uh, premise. 
I don't want to go into a ton of detail because I might, I've considered maybe I should like really truly finish it with an end and then I can read it on here one day for people, but I, I haven't gotten quite that far yet. Uh, but you know, I just, it's a class that I feel like I should have had fun in. I didn't end up having fun in it because of the stupid, ugh, super extended feedback. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just kind of was what it was, you know, it, it's, it's creative writing. It's writing in a creative fashion. So those are all the classes that I took this past uh, semester, and I think I want to end the show by sort of taking taking some stock uh, of my time in education. You know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I've been I've been in education in some way for sixteen different years, and the fact that my education, at least you know, in a formal classroom setting, is maybe for now or maybe permanently like complete is you know it's kind of strange uh you know i think I, sp I i think i speak for a lot of people when i say or like you know people have completed a degree or maybe they just did a high school diploma or, or whatever um when i say that you know until that last day of class it kind of felt like your and my education would never end <laughs> Um, and, you know, for some people, that's a positive thing in the sense that they're like, they really wanted their education to be done and over with. And um, and others, it's kind of overwhelming in that it's like, whoa, this this is something like this is this has been my life for like nine months out of the year every day. And like, it's just it's overwhelming to think that my life is going to be completely changed in that I'm not going to be doing this every day anymore. Um and and by great, I just I kind of mean this like it's not a great change, and that this is like a good change. I think this is like a, just a giant change, and I kind of feel myself in the moment, sort of between those two feelings right now. Which I ne honestly I never thought I would say three years ago. I always I always enjoyed education, um, but the more time that I was in college, the more time I felt that I wanted my education to come to a close. Um, but all, of course, at the same time, I can't help but think like, wow, there's a possibility that I may never step into an into a classroom to be educated by someone again. And it, like I said, it's always possible that I could decide to go back for a graduate degree or, or a, a, a law degree or something else. But like as it stands right now, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do that. And I wouldn't say I feel overwhelmed right now in the sense it's like there's some catastrophic change coming to my life but it, it definitely feels different like I know at the start of this episode I was like nah life really doesn't feel that different right now and largely I would like still agree with that but it's just kind of thinking about the fact that next September I'm not going to like set foot in a classroom at some point it just feels completely alien. Like, it just, it feels wrong. It feels like, that's what I've done every year, and now I'm not doing that again? What? What? No, that's just, that's wrong. But I also have to take stock and think about, like, hey, you know, I I also, I have I finished a degree in a global pandemic, and that took up most of the time, is, like, dealing with the pandemic stuff and educating myself along the way, and... You know, my class of students and, like, the students from next year and, 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 like, for the next, realistically, the next 12 to 15 years, all the kids that are going to school right now, like, they're going to have a unique educational experience to tell future, their, their, their kids about their future generations. Because, you know, it's not often that you have a global pandemic. And, you know, at this point, I, I, I'm probably kind of, like, rambling and I probably do have some more concrete reflection that I could have if I really you know, wrote stuff more down in, in, in more detail. Um, but I've probably gone on for quite a bit already. So like, I just, I, I just, I can't believe it's over. I'm glad it's over, but I'm also not glad it's over because it's just, it's so, so bizarre to think that it's over. Um, and, but you know, if I have more than I want to share on this, I think I'd rather write down something a little more concrete and like talk about it on like the, the next episode with something a little bit more coherent. Or maybe maybe if I do a September episode, I'll be like, the kids are going back to school and I'm not, and that's weird. Uh, but it, it's just it's a wild time right now. It's it's so strange. 
uh, to say the least. And you know, somehow, some way, I'm I'm done. I am done with a college degree. I did it. And, and that's just maddening to me to think that was ever possible. Not because I didn't think like, oh, I'm never gonna get a degree, but just because it's like, man, it's all right. Like it's already happened. I've I've done it. It's done. It's 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 so weird. <laughs> it's just weird. Um, but rather than continue rambling, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna conclude this uh this here podcast. So uh, I have been Brandon Puddle. I have been your host. This has been uh the Creative Outlet podcast on June sixth, two thousand and. Uh, 22. Um, as always, I think you should try to do some sort of engagement. You know, if you're if you're a fan of that, uh, you know, I've been going I've gone on for an hour and 45 minutes here. You might want to like consider leaving a comment somewhere along the way. Maybe you've, maybe you've liked if this was on a video or hey, if you know if you're on Anchor.fm slash T H E C O P, you might want to might want to send me an audio message. Uh, it's an option. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm. I think I'm going to sign out here. It has been uh, a pleasure getting to come back and do this for everybody again. And like I said, hopefully I get to do some more of this, but we'll have to, we'll have to see where the job world takes me first. But yeah, that's, uh, that's everything I wanted to say for today. Uh, have a fantastic time in whatever you're going to listen to next, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>